Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Tom Cole from Abacus. Tom, how are you? I'm very well, Toby. Yourself? Really good, thank you. Really good. Lovely to see you. Yeah, it's good. Pleasure to, uh, pleasure to be on here. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Listen, we've known your company well for a little while now, and it's been, uh, it's been great to work with you and great to see some of the sort of success that you guys have been going through. Um, but give us a little bit of background. Give us a bit of background of your story, and then give us a bit of background about Abacus and what you guys are doing and doing so well at the moment. Yep, so my background prior to Abacus was uh, working within hedge funds, so the other side of the fence, the actual client side. Uh, it's an interesting, obviously, position to be in, getting to see the business processes, the, the different business operations and the technology that side that's that's working and now I've transitioned to uh, to Abacus so some examples of funds that I was working at was Comet Capital, Ballyasney Asset Management, uh, Glencore uh, prior to that I was actually outside of outside of finance working like within publicist group um, within advertising and marketing which again was is probably irrelevant for this conversation but nevertheless so now I'm uh, working at Abacus. Uh, we started the London office four and a half years ago. Uh, Abacus is, is almost a household name, certainly within North America. Uh, we was founded in 2008. Offices in New York, Boston, uh, LA, Dallas, uh, San Francisco, uh, and Connecticut. Yeah, basically we've been enjoying some great growth and London was the uh, was the next organic step and I was the, the person that working with Chris Grandy, uh, the CEO of Abacus, set up the presence here. So it's um, it's definitely been been a journey. Uh, four and a half years has flown by. We've got some fantastic clients um, and we've grown very well. Um, not necessarily um, too much or too quickly because that inherently can, uh, can cause the wheels to fall off, but we've certainly been controlled in our approach. Uh, with the backing of uh, Chris, it's been uh, it's been fantastic because, yeah, we, the the expectation has been set that we want a sustainable business, not necessarily uh, to be owning a quick buck out of the region. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really important, isn't it? Because uh, you know, a business there that has scaled um, you know, as impressively as it, as it has done. You know, I think we're talking about six hundred odd clients now, isn't it? That you guys have got, which you know, you mentioned there. Um, it's 2008. It started, isn't it? That's a, that's good going over that that sort of period. And 200 plus, uh, you know, headcount now. I think it is. It's a great story, uh, and to see that replicated across New York, as you say, across San Francisco, Dallas, Los Angeles, Boston, everywhere around, around that sort of stuff, and then see it come over to London. The p- part of it you mentioned there, your background. You know, one, one of the secret sources is you have people who've been very successful on the other side that have been able to do that. You know, with with, with you know with the company as well. And sort of have that sort of uh, poacher term gamekeeper sort of aspect to it as well. That seems to be a, a sort of regular for, force of it all. Yeah, definitely. As I say, there's there's different challenges either side of the fence, but it's the fact that myself and obviously us, the more importantly, our staff that are delivering the service. So we we have, as you all know very well, we have a very strong appetite when we're attracting talent to try and delve into the pools of talent that have previous experience within capital markets, ideally hedge funds, private equity, the clients that we're serving within the alternative asset space. Um, yeah, obviously they're engineers, technologists at heart, but being empathetic to the, uh, to the client's requirements and issues is, uh, is priceless in my opinion. And that's why we're, uh, we're always enticing and trying to retain talent um, with, the, with the pedigree from working within uh, alternative asset managers. Obviously, it's not always practical, but it's certainly uh, it's certainly an area that we uh, we always try to uh, to attract from. Yeah, and I think you've done really well with it as well to sort of uh, be attractive to those people and give the variety and a little bit more to uh, you know the people who are coming to the business. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Give us a, give us a little bit more as well about the uh, the, the sort of the, the business and your product overview and, and what you guys are getting involved in at the moment. Yep. So Abacus. Being an IT managed service provider, obviously technology is our core discipline. Um, what we're very passionate about is looking at the latest and greatest technology solutions that are out there and packaging them into basically a consumable product, a per user per month billing model. Uh, obviously, times evolve. So Abacus was born on the private cloud paradigm. We've then slowly morphed into hybrid. And now we've, uh, over the past few years, we've been well and truly at home within the, the full public cloud. So that, that's, that's a powerful message. It's, we're actually agnostic to the under, underlying cloud deployment model uh, of private hybrid or fully public. So 
yet there are certain use cases and certain areas where people might gravitate to a certain type of deployment model uh, and we're able to accommodate them. So that's the, the, the flagship product is called Abacus Flex and that is the per user per month. We, we like to simplify things as much as possible to our end, to our end clients and by that I mean we're constantly evaluating new products, R&D, pushing and pulling different products in, depending on what's happening. It's obviously very relevant at the moment. And we'd, um, and that's basically taking the thinking away from the client. So we're almost, we're their managed service provider as business as usual, but we're also an extension of their R&D department. So in fact, we probably are their R&D department from a technology standpoint for the corporate IT side of the business. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a compelling, it's a compelling product to our clients um, and obviously what powers this is our people. So it sounds very, uh, very cliche, but it's, it's a matter of fact that it's, it's our people are our largest assets. Uh, and that's again, it's, it's kudos to the business, to our HR department and processes to, uh, to make sure that we keep flourishing. I think that's a, that's a really important part of it. And, and um, so it's really interesting you say about people as well, because I think, yeah, from, from first hand, I've seen the caliber of some of the people you've brought into the business and know the quality of the team. And that's always, I think, been the reputational strength of, of the business. But this year, uh, the pandemic's put an enormous amount of strain on it. I know you guys pride yourselves on being, on being a great place to work and looking after your people and doing all that sort of stuff as well. But tell us about it. Tell, tell us what's the, you know, let, let, let's focus on the lessons learned from, from the pandemic and how you guys are going to come out stronger and better from it. Looking at your people strategy. Tell us a little bit about what you've done and how that's worked for you. Yeah, so obviously pandemic's not a good thing. Um, so again, we've been absolutely laser focused on staff welfare being at the forefront of, um, of this whole event. And it's been tricky. So certainly during the start of lockdown, well, throughout lockdown, there's been ambiguity throughout. So should people shouldn't be working, should can't they be working, et cetera. So we've been quite lucky in a way that um, we've got mature frame, a mature framework, got mature processes in place that we've been actually able to embrace the remote working approach, which obviously remote working lessens the risk of people that within their own devices, et cetera. But nevertheless, there is a requirement within our business to be on the ground and have boots on the ground uh, to serve people within their offices, uh, any break, fix, et cetera. So what we've done is we've, we've done some pretty standard stuff, like from a, from a process standpoint, like ensuring that PPE is in place, ensuring that questionnaires are filled out by clients and by our engineers to make sure risk is known and we can deal with that appropriately. I mean, as a matter of fact, in from our New York office, actually law the engineers have to complete on a daily basis when they're coming into the office some form of a, a questionnaire to ensure that they're fit, fit for work and obviously none of the symptoms are present. So we, again, we're, we're moving forward with our engineers working, but in a controlled way. And again, it's, it's opening our eyes for business, like how post 2020, 2021, how things can operate. Because again, with, with the remote working format that we've got, we're as effective possibly in some areas more effective than we was historically. Uh, and again, it's all, it's just, it's a testament to the, uh, to the organization and maturity and the processes that we've got in place to, to monitor how people are from a productivity standpoint, ensure that they're healthy, et cetera. So again, just, it's, we can't, we can't stress them enough that, uh, yeah, the health and safety of our workforce at Ending University, our clients is obviously paramount. So it's something that we, uh, we take very seriously, um, which we have to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's an important part of it, and it's uh, you know, particularly with a business like yours, I, I imagine there's sort of increased sort of focus on that. It's, it, you know, it's, it was such a change, you know, to how everyone works, and particularly in the markets that you guys serve, to see that sort of thing coming through. That that actually people forget that probably in this sort of space there is the need for that sort of physical presence as much as anything else. You 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 naturally saw a, a sort of well, I'd imagine you you, you saw a natural surge in in requests and need for help and the workload increased how did you guys manage that yes that's, that's a good question so the generally speaking the technology is built for purpose and what we're going through now our technology there's no big bangs i've been asked this numerous occasions tom what did you have to do to kind of well not me personally what did the business have to do to kind of navigate this problem uh, from a technology standpoint um it's, it's designed for this for remote working whether it be in the office etc but again from from a people standpoint so there was, there was almost a natural rebalance that happened. So talking about our on-site engineers that are required to go out into the field and break fix, et cetera, 
during the hard lockdown, that was the requirement for that was zero by law or by regulations or guidance. Um, so what we did is we naturally kind of we folded them into our remote support team. The, the skill sets are definitely transferable overnight. Uh, so that was a that was that was kind of the easy part of the puzzle to say, hey, you work for X team, join Y team, start helping out with requests, etc. The the problem is again working for a, an IT managed service provider that prides ourselves on service at scale. We're very process driven. So again, there was we we have a department that is focused purely on our IT service management system or ticketing system. There was a total re-engineering on the fly of process that had to change to make sure that we was doing things not just ad hocly, but doing things thoroughly and properly. So again, it was it's very easy for me to say, oh yeah, we swap these people with those people. It's it's kind of the tip of the iceberg in the managed service space. There's there's a lot of work underneath the water that's uh that's, uh, that's happening and again tip of the hat to everyone in, in the relative departments because yeah we was far from perfect but it was uh it was it was actually quite quite a proud moment i think i even dropped in my linkedin quoting a mike tyson it's all very well having a plan until someone punches him in the face it's uh again it was it was very relevant that um yeah the teams all pulled together done exactly what i needed to do and more so so, so, so with a team that sort of adapted like that, being punched in the face and come back in a in a in a different sort sort, sort of way, tell us about what you've been doing because look, you've been growing through the thing. I think you've all you know feedbacks traditionally been really really strong from people in the team and all that sort of stuff. What have you done to sort of you, know, you mentioned the productivity has been up in certain cases and and, that, and that's that's all fantastic. You know, dealing with that sort of thing and then coming back to it and, and coming through it strong is, is exactly what we love to hear on on, on this show and have heard it you know consistently over the last few months. Tell us some of the things that you guys have been doing to make sure you're, you're you know, you, you've spoken about the safety aspect there, but have you kept that sort of uh, esprit de corps, that sort of uh, strength of the team and that connectivity together at the same time as well? Yeah, so I, I don't think that question is limited to the MSP or my businesses. It's all businesses. And again, what we're sitting on now, like the, the collaboration tools have just, they've just come on leaps and bounds as to their capacity to how many people can be on on simultaneous connections, like the technology, like the integration between like teams specifically between the Office 365 suite has been, it's been very impressive. So there's definitely been, we've been leveraging new and current technology for sure. And then there's also been more, more kind of social elements, like ensuring that people are, are talking to each other, ensuring there's, there's set stand up meetings and stuff that would explicitly happen within the office, not necessarily by definition, but would just happen. So again, the, excuse my Americanism, but the elevator chat and the, uh, the yeah, the corridor. Water coolers. Talk, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the water coolers, yeah. Them conversations are, uh, yeah, they, they have to be more defined now, like through Teams and other phone calls, et cetera. So again, we're, we're putting some kind of formatting, we've got formats in place where people are able to collaborate and talk. And again, there's there's more there's other fun activities that I probably uh, won't divulge on here, but there's other there's more social uh, stuff happening to ensure that people that's are, another are show. talking. And again, quite recently, actually, there's there's something that's um, that our leadership team is very passionate about is is mental health. And this isn't a fad. This isn't me just talking up to the camera now just because I want want us to be perceived as a thoughtful company. It's it's, it's, it's a matter of fact that it is something that the business is passionate about ensuring that people have their own personal struggles etc it's, it's a big change for everyone working from home whether you've got kids no kids working in confined space not being able to commute to travel to engage with other humans so again there's been there's been other initiatives internally that, um, that have kind of ensured that yeah our staff aren't it's it's front and center that our staff are paramount and we're we're here to, to listen and to help as best as we can um so yeah it's yeah, again, it's it's something that just pushes the message that people are are, are our key assets. Yeah, no, very much, very much so. And that's very clear from everything I've ever seen about the business as well. The other side of the business's strength is is obviously the tech, um, and uh, and how well you you know you you, you utilise it and the security that you give your your customers. Talk to us a little bit about that. Talk to us about um, you know how how tech's worked and 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 how you've sort of. Uh, you know, mastered its use and help your clients through, you know, through, through this period? What's, what sort of learns learn and lessons you got there? Um, on the whole, there's been no big bang, no big transitions or transformations of what we're doing and how we're doing it. 
so again that's 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 a good thing it's showing what, what people are paying for and what we're selling is doing what it should be doing uh which is the resilient side of things and obviously the mobility side of things um within our within our private cloud there was obviously our, our cto and the engineering team were very busy ensuring that licenses capacities because again when people work from home different elements of the infrastructure get in leverage other than uh, relative to others so there was definitely a rebalance that was happening but we were on the front foot uh, well and truly there uh, so much so from back in february in um, 2020 we exercised a, a global uh, work from home initiative pre-lockdown because it was it was becoming more and more big apparent that something big could be happening so that enabled us to kick the tires on our technology as a service organization also our clients uh, inherently and obviously also the the service workflows etc so we definitely we we went into this lockdown with both eyes open and as testing as much as we can but again back back to that quote it's 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 tough to test everything and every eventuality in such an extreme circumstance. But yeah, overall technology did exactly what it should be doing. Um, again, even during the lockdown period, we was able to actually implement some clients, uh, which again, purely remotely, no one on site. It's never really been done. It has been done in some exceptional circumstances, but this again, this is a very exceptional start, circumstance. <laughs> so, Again, there was certain processes and technologies and deployment tools that were used to make sure that we could reach our clients without physically being there. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the key things. Look, you mentioned there that this is unprecedented, and when you think about, um, you know, the foresight there to think right, February. Look, in in March, I'll, I'll be you know, very honest. In March, when uh, people said right, you're going to leave the off the office, I, I fully thought we'd be back in about three weeks and everything would be uh, back to not back to normal again. And here we are. Yeah, what seven eight months later on, and it's uh, and just the continuity and the ability for for companies like Company yours, like yours, who've allowed everything to happen afterwards, has been exceptional. It's been uh, it's it's been it's been a really strong process and a slick process, and and tech's been, you know, thrust to the forefront of everything as it has been for a long time, and and just made things uh, in, you know, work incredibly well. So hats off to you guys for for, do, for doing that. I know data's played more and more of a, of a, of a of a part as well. Tell us a little bit about what's happening with, with you guys with you guys there. Yeah, so probably one of our biggest and most important things that we've done over this whole event is communication. And that's obviously a very blanket statement. But largely where once again, once the noises were happening, the lockdowns, et cetera, could be coming into effect, then we we obviously we we created the pandemic committee, which everyone within certain regions, senior leaders within each regions were uh, were set up to obviously ensure that all the right decisions were being made, etc. But what we also did was communicate with our clients. We invoked a survey. Some clients might have uh, been complaining it was probably too frequent. So during the lockdown build-up, they were on a daily basis. We was uh, surveying our clients to understand very basically what are you doing from a logistical standpoint? Are you working from the office? Or do you have a rotor in place? Are you closing the office? And obviously, as things are slowly starting to come back to normal, hopefully then we start surveying about people's future plans. The reason for this was twofold. It was firstly to make sure that us as a business, we was equipped with appropriate information to make good decisions. So back to my point about reallocation of resources through different departments, that was largely formed from that information we was getting from clients who were very, very good at being responsive to that. And then secondly, it actually benefited our clients. So our clients are understanding what their peers were doing. Again, serving a decent sized chunk of the alternative asset management space, that was a good insight and good intelligence for them to also make their decisions and understand as a community what people were doing. Uh, and we make it public available on our website. There's the, there's the COVID uh, preparedness page. And again, it's, all the data is obviously anonymous for obvious reasons, but we're statistically, we're putting things forward to make sure we're over communicating. So that, that, was, that was the single most important point for me personally through this process is the communication which derived data. And obviously that data was turned into meaningful information. Yes, yeah, brilliant. I think I mean, yeah, you've, you've, a couple of things really to pick out there is the sort of da data into meaningful communication. Um, and then over communication is a word I love, I love particularly at this sort of stage. I think you know, if, you, if you think about, you know, one of the most important things full stop over communication in my mind is, is, you know, people will do things and recognize it's heard in so many different ways by so many different people that, clarifying that message and repeating that message is one of the core, core uh, elements of uh, 
you know, crisis uh, crisis management as far as I'm concerned. And we've moved on to some, you know, some of the big buzzwords of, uh, of, of tech over the last five years have been data. And uh, I'm going to bring in another one now, which is cyber. Um, so, you know, th this has been a sort of um, uh, Everest moment for, for uh, cyber criminals all, all over the world. And it's never been more important to, you know, to have the right sort of defences in place. When, when you see this coming, and as you say, look, you've had foresight, um, you know, as, as far back as February to get this right. Tell us about what you've rushed to implement and how you, how, you know, how you helped on, on the cyber war. So on the whole, it's, it's quite a, a bland and direct response that we haven't rushed to do anything. But as again, by design, we using some more buzz, buzz terminology. We're operating via a defense in depth model and we're using a best of breed technology stack. So from a tech standpoint, Again, we're always improving. We've got things well covered um, for now. And again, there's there's always evolution. I know of stuff in our R&D department that we're looking to um, to delve into deeper. Uh, but overall, there was no big bang. There was no rush to get something delivered or deployed because there was a weakness. Um, however, the one point that, again, it's, it's just a replay of most people's um, point to cybersecurity is the weakest link in any armor of cyber is people so and there were some specific um, examples of some particularly distasteful um, phishing attacks and social engineering attacks they're all focused they're always focused on the individual the people so again we was making sure throughout this process as and when they were becoming uh, available we was educating us our clients and staff as best as possible and again as part of going back to our product offering as part of our offering we do also bake into like cyber security um, training, uh, online training schedule. And that includes phishing tests and then just general know-how on things to be suspicious about and look at. So again, it's the biggest focus over this event for now has very much been on education and again, communication over certain types of events, et cetera, that are happening. Again, the technology is the easy part of the equation. We look after that. We go through the R&D processes, put in as best solutions as possible. But right now, it's always going to be the human element that's going to be the weakest part. So again, we can't stress enough to our clients that that's definitely something they go through the training, they repeat, they test, they repeat, they test. It's something that's, uh, that's imperative. Do you know what? It's really interesting you say that because I think cyber's got this sort of ultra techie sort of um, uh, notion to it, isn't it? When you think of, of, of cyber crime and cyber security, it's sort of you immediately cascade into a sort of very technical solution to it. But I remember a few years ago, we had uh, Connor Kinn and uh, Marshall Waste CTO, um, who was on a panel for us. Uh, and it was remarkable to me that basically what he was talking about is people just not being idiots, being the, uh, the predominant part. And there's, there's some, uh, you know, cyber, cyber crime effectively, uh, you know, relies on people being stupid in terms of some of the ways that yeah. they're, they're, they're dealing with it. So that education piece is uh is so often the, the 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 most underrated key and i think you know some of the, the keys to it is just making sure you work with clients to understand that they're they're there and ahead of the game a little bit and just being sensible about what they do with things yeah definitely it's, again there is a tech there is a technology side to things and again course, there is yeah, stuff yeah. that we're looking to evolve uh to kind of you know the threat landscapes changing and changed even more so so there, there is stuff that we can and are doing um, but again, it's, it's stuff that's tangible, that's achievable here and now. Uh, so back to your initial question about what we're doing right now. Right now, um, what we have done throughout is just ensure that people have the right education, the right information in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So look, sp sp speaking of, uh, of tech and looking ahead now as we come up to the, uh, you know, this will be November by the time it's gone out, unbelievably. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we, you know, we're right into the depths of 2020 as we sort of uh, turn a new calendar over to, to 2021. Tell us about some of the things you can see on the landscape. What's, uh, let's look at tech moving forward. What's, 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 what's coming up? Yeah, so again, I think this is, this is a generic blanket statement, not necessarily relevant to, to the industry as a whole, but it's just a generalist. So again, you mentioned cyber, so that, that's not going away. And there is technology that's, that's evolving um, so like the zero trust approach. So basically trust nothing, verify everything. That's something that's not brand new. It's not bleeding edge, but given how people are operating on a more remote nature, it's definitely becoming more and more relevant. So there's definitely, there's going to be more security paradigms that are, should and would be, uh, would be exercised. Um, and again, it all partly relating to cyber, but also business intelligence and insights where people 
are losing the control almost by not sitting next to each other and being visually available throughout the office. Um, so again, it's, there's an element of big brother, but understanding how people are working, from, even from a social standpoint, but then also what they're doing, where they're going from a data protection aspect to the data loss protection. So it's definitely there's solutions out there. There's, there's tools out there. Again, it's not bleeding edge, what I'm saying, but it's probably just shining a brighter light over that world uh, more than ever with a remote working um, approach. And then I think we can't we can't get through this uh, without this discussion. Mentioned the B word. Uh, so there is obviously there's this big Brexit event that's due to happen at the end of the year. Uh, everyone seems to have very well not different, but there seems to be different opinions as to how the GDPR world and privacy laws are going to be impacted. Right now, my well my and our stance with it is is most businesses that are GDPR compliant, they've gone through the relevant processes of mapping the data, understanding who's touching the data, having workflows in place to make sure that if people request for delayed data to be deleted, it can be done quickly and effectively and reporting, etc. So people should be in a good position now to weather whatever storm comes our way. But that said, it's still a, it's a known unknown at the moment. So it's uh all eyes open to see what, what falls out of Brexit from a privacy standpoint and uh, how the alignment happens. Yeah, I mean, there's there's, uh, there's so many different angles depending on who you want to listen to about what what uh, what happens, good or bad, Dan. That that, that angle that that is a uh, that is a whole nother show. And I think yeah, depending on which way you're facing, which way, whether you're the part of the 49 or the 51 percent, um, you, you're going to have a different view on, on what goes there. But what is what is without question is there's going to have a material impact on uh, you know on on business in the country and uh, you know good or bad uh, there's going to be some change around that and I think that the sort of uh, adaptability and the appetite for change is going to be some of the important parts right yeah exactly and there's 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 likely to be more technology and solutions out there that will be able to uh, to hold people's hands uh, to a certain extent to, to get them through and one one last point which I haven't mentioned that's more the the first for automation and um, self-fulfillment and by that I mean so people being able to have new starters that are working from home and be able to deploy their hardware not necessarily physically but have everything set up in an automated fashion quickly streamlined as effectively as possible even self-fulfillment with um, with new users from an administrative standpoint so again advocates are blessed to have an internal software team we have a proprietary portal where clients could go on it's very much they can navigate what they're consuming, but also go for administrative tasks such as adding new users, removing new users. And then once that's all fully automated, then there's less human error, happens quickly, and all the benefits of automation that we realize we can do more with less, et cetera. So it's, um, it's definitely should and will be a focus of Abacus, and we're, uh, we're definitely excited to see what our software team can, uh, can deliver for that. No doubt that'll be great things as well, uh, as, as usual with you guys. So look, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting time. Um, you guys have done a great job, you know, going through through this year. I know it's been a, you know, a year of progression and change and all that sort of stuff. We've seen you grow. We've seen the business grow. Uh, we've seen some, you know, some really strong feedback as to, as to what you guys have been doing. Tell us, um, uh, you know, for people who are listening there and want to get in touch, look, there's, there's so many different companies that you've helped all over, all over the States and Europe and, and such like. For people who are hearing this and thinking, right, well, I need I need some of that action, need to get involved in it. What's the best way to get in touch with you, Tom? Yeah, so obviously standard standard channels, so LinkedIn uh, and via the website with uh, for Abacus Group LLC.com, we have all the relative uh, relevant contact details on there. So um, yeah, please please reach out. Uh, be more than happy, even if it's just a conversation. Be more than happy to have a conversation. It's always a good conversation with you, so uh, I highly recommend it from my side as well. Tom, thanks so much for sharing the Abacus story and giving us uh, so generously the, you know, a bit of the stuff that's gone well well for you and, and a few of the learns and, and, and everything in between. And look, lovely, love working with you guys, and, uh, and thanks so much for, uh, for coming on and being uh, yeah, so generous in your time today as well. No, thank you. It's been great. Good man. Listen, thanks to everyone for watching. We'll see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.